Okay, good afternoon. This is Wednesday, June 2nd, our class session, Math 264. So our plan for today is we're going to look at one more time at a qualitative argument. And, and you are doing this problem 2.18 alt. So let me give you something of a clue here, a pretty good clue as to how to approach this. And then again, it'll demonstrate the power of the qualitative argument. We are in chapter two, we are talking about first order systems. And the impression you can have from yesterday, and then even looking at this problem later, is wow, systems can be very, very complicated. So, do all we have to go on, is all we have to go on our numerical machines and our qualitative gut feelings? Well, sometimes it is in a system, but we will develop some analytic tools for systems. And so in chapter five, in the section on our website, if you're looking at our list of sections 2.4. Let me share that page with you. We talk about analytic methods for special systems. So your takeaway right now is systems are really messed up. Systems are really complicated, but there are some systems I can do with my bare hands. So that's the point they want to bring to you in the analytic methods for special systems. And then what we're gonna do is repeat in chapter one, we remember that we had Euler's method for first order equations. Can we create Euler's method for first order systems? The answer is yes, we just need another column. Instead of tracking slope only, now we're gonna track X rate of change, Y rate of change, new X, new Y. Okay, so Euler's method is gonna transfer over directly to systems. And then we can spend a few minutes possibly discussing this famous model, although we can't really do it justice in this class, but he gives you a fair interpretation of it. Okay, so that's the goal today. Two four, two five, and two seven. But I want to give you one nice tip about two one eight alt. I'm going to go back to my paper. Okay, I keep also seeing this obscure reference that I'm getting the machine running, and we almost have that done. So we're going to encounter our first exam this week which I'll describe to you in detail tomorrow and will be released tomorrow night. In the first week, I was getting things running, so I did not deliver your homeworks daily, which is my intention. But now I think we have our machine, our process. I guess I'm about processes. I think we have our process up and running. So you submit a homework tonight. I'm pretty comfortable, I'll be able to return that homework to you before class tomorrow. That at least would be my habit. That's what I'm intending to do. And if not, return class, return homework on the next day. So you constantly have that homework to refer to. So next day return of homework, you know, within 24 hours return of homework is clearly the goal. You have your Google Drive folders where you have the return homework You'll get grade reports at the end of each week and you have solutions posted to each problem after they hand it in. You hand in at 11.59, theoretically I could turn on the solutions at midnight, uh, which I could do, but I don't do that in an automated way. So I usually turn on the solutions the next morning. Depends on when I'm awake if I'm up very late at night or up very early in the morning. 
So this is our goal today. So exam one is going to be released. by 11.59, Thursday, June 3, due by 11.59, Monday, June 7. Uh, just to tell you how that works and what the workload is, Right now you're doing, when we settle into it, six problems a week. First week you did nine, this week you're doing six, and then we're gonna go to a more measured pace. Over the weekend here, you know, target will probably be, it is approximately six problems. So you're doing those six problems over those four days. Uh, there is no alternative to putting in a time crunch somewhere. So they're gonna be very similar to homework problems. The homework problems that you've been handed in, which are kind of like the book problems, maybe with an extra question to them, uh, conditions of what you may use and so forth, I will put in the instructions and that's what we'll discuss tomorrow. But this gives you some idea of the scale of the exam. These problems are 10 points each. Well, I don't want to say approximately. And that makes up 60 points on an exam, 180 points on all three exams, whereas your homework totals 120 points. So that makes up the class 300 point total. I've explained to you my philosophy of grading on the scale of zero to five and really a very similar philosophy for grading on a scale of zero to 10. And uh, you might just say scaled from five to 10. So you'll see how that works too. And then again, if everything's running smoothly, these would be returned to you relatively quickly too. I don't know if it's 24 hours or 48 hours. Uh, just to give you a visual on this, and you can check this out on the website, you know, there's week one, there's week two exam. Then I think there's week three, Week four, exam, and week five, week six, exam. So that looks the way I spaced it. And I'll share a screen, go to the resources and the assessments. And that looks like the way I've spaced it, 14 days apart. Uh, on this last one, I think you have one extra day. So instead of Monday, 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 I think I did Monday, Monday, Tuesday, and likely I did that because July 4th is a holiday. Again, you, you have responsibilities and you have plans along the July 4th weekend too, but unfortunately that's where the class ended. So I threw in, I think I intended to put one extra day in there for the holiday, but we'll worry about that when we get there. Okay, stop share, back to paper. Let's look carefully at 2.1-8 and show you the power of qualitative argument. So you have these two first order problems, dx dt is sine y and dy dt 
is 2x minus x cubed minus y. So the goal here is to describe the equilibrium points. And the words, the commands I could use there are describe them, find them. Finding them exactly in the system is not simple. In, in other words, you gotta do some numerical approximation. Describing them is not as hard. And then you want to create the phase portrait. And I highly recommend you use the first order systems notebook in Mathematica that I gave you. At least to show you, oh, sorry, let me give you the correct title so I don't screw that up. At least to show you what the slope field looks like. First order systems. Can't write and talk at the same time or you end up writing what you're talking. I use this Mathematica notebook here. And even if you just use that for the slope field to get a clue on the slope field, you can by hand draw the sample phase portrait. Remember what a phase portrait is. Really a demonstration of all the things that could happen. A sample of all types of solutions to the system. But the problem with any technology is that even if you're running it very, very well, the technology doesn't treat any one point different than any other. It's kind of agnostic as to what's important or not. So the concept is you have to know essentially what's important before you open the machine. So let's think about these carefully. Where are the equilibrium points? Logically, where should the equilibrium points be? Where? Do I get both of these equations equal to zero at the same time? And I'm gonna deliberately use red and green there. On screen, the red and green doesn't always come out. Colors don't always come out red, green, but on the scanning, they should come out a little bit better when I scan the sheet and post it. Right down this page one. So I'm very, very interested in where dx dt is zero or where dy dt is zero. And say it like this, where basically where there's no X change or where there's no Y change. No X change means no X movement, no movement left or right. That's when DX DT is zero. No Y change means no Y movement, no movement up or down. And if I find a point where there's no movement left or right and no movement up or down, well, then I find a point that's not moving. That's the equilibrium point. That's what I wanna do. So what I really need to know is, can I find the places where there's no horizontal movement and no vertical movement? And let's think about that logically on a picture. I'll move this paper up. So this is the phase plane. This is the XY phase plane. And I am interested in when sine of y is zero. Well, your knowledge of sine says every multiple of pi sine of y is zero. So logically, at pi, at two pi, at three pi, at four pi, and all the way up forever, you have no x movement on those lines there's no movement left or right. There's only movement up or down. 
also at zero pi, minus one pi, minus two pi, minus three pi, minus four pi, and, and all the way down. What about this object? When is this object equal to zero? Well, you bring the y to the other side and you've got a cubic equation. And we're trying to do that consistently in green. So I'll do two x minus x cubed or factor out the x, x, factor out the x correctly, x times two minus x squared. Now this is a cubic equation. It's got three crossing places and they are at x equals zero, which makes y equals zero, or at x equals root two, which makes y equals zero, or at x equals minus root two, which makes y equal to zero. And you can draw cubics. You don't need a lot of help drawing cubics. You've done that before. I don't know if I'm doing that to scale, right? Does that bump cross that line? That might be important. Maybe I need to consult a more accurate thing like a machine, or I could just study this curve more carefully with calculus. But do you see what's important about these three points? These three points are on the red line and on the green curve. So they have both no X motion, no Y motion. And that immediately tells you what? Oh. All these points where red meets green is equilibrium points. So this system clearly has infinitely many equilibrium points. If I wanted to mock that up in a more accurate way, of course, I would pull something out like Desmos, right? Let's try it. Let's try uh, y of x equals 2x. I could, I should say, I should be true to my t's. As long as I say y of t equals 2t minus t cubed, then mathematical will interpret t as a dependent variable, independent variable. And then the horizontal lines, y of t equals k times pi. Mathematica asked me for a slider. I could either do a slider like that, continuous slider, or here's another way to do that. Let's make a list, excuse me, of minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, one, two, three. Now I've got all these horizontals. Let's make this red as my drawing. Let's make this green as my drawing. Okay, now I have all, and I do see that this does not dip into the first pair. So now I see all equilibrium points. Mathematica can approximate them. This would involve solving cubic equation. This is just, we recognize the square root of two, zero and minus square root of two. These other ones here are harder to approximate, but they're easy to describe. So you could interpret find from the problem as saying describe. Now let's think about this qualitatively. And let's do, and I'm gonna go back to my paper, a super zoom on a small portion of this graph. I wanna do a super zoom on that circle. I'm gonna to have to go to another page to do it, of course. But before I do it, let's pay attention to sine. And let's pay attention to this cubic. This cubic is y equals two x minus x cubed. But if I'm above that cubic, if y is bigger than 2x minus x cubed, notice dy dt is always negative. So I'm feeling above that cubic, solutions going down, and below that cubic, solutions going up. Now let's look at sine y. 
between zero and pi, sine y is positive. So the x motion is positive. So I've seen in this band, always positive x motion. And in the next band, always negative x motion. And that's gonna vary by band. The bands are gonna alternate between positive x motion and negative x motion. On the bands, I have zero x motion. And that's going straight up where the other solutions are going up and straight down where the other solutions are going down. And now you see why I need to do the super zoom. So let's go and look at those two equilibrium points. And let's take into account this upness, downness, leftness, and rightness. And you see a magical thing. So I'm gonna to try to connect my papers here. I'm gonna to try to go onto the next paper. Super zoom. By the way, I could do super zoom with mathematic and technology, but you know that that would take a little bit of time working too. So let's take this circle, draw it big, big, big. Let's take that green line coming through it. Let's take those red bands, two red bands at the axis, x-axis, and at the y-axis. I'm sorry, at, x, at y equals pi. And here are two equilibrium points. So now, notice the pressure in this side is horizontally right, left, right. And vertically, up on this side and down on this side. So let's try to do the bathtub argument like we did previously. Uh, did I, I said these and I did them backwards, didn't I? If you do my super zoom, and now I'm gonna to have to move up my paper entirely. This was left up here to the left, then right, then left. So let's try to see what happens when I use this information and it collides with this information. For example, in this section, if I go up, and right, I'm gonna be behaving like this. I'm exaggerating. I don't know how steep it will be or how slight it will be. In this region, if I go down and right, it will go like this. I'm exaggerating again, I'm doing a qualitative analysis. Let's do the same thing, left and up, left and down. Now let's go left and up over here. And left and down over here. Now this is a great exaggeration. It's a great magnification, but it's also pretty accurate. So now let's decide what's happening. As I trace a solution near this equilibrium point, I must be going possibly left down and then right down. I'm doing a flyby on that equilibrium point. What about this side? 
right up, left up. So I am actually not being attracted to that equilibrium point. I'm being repelled. What happens in this space? Now, again, I'm speaking extremely qualitatively. We need something to confirm this work. That's the notebook. That's the Mathematica. That's the slope fields. That's the numerical analysis. In here, I seem to be going up and left. But then as I cross this vertically, I should be crossing this red line vertically both times. I didn't quite do it. As I cross that vertically, I should be going up and right. When I cross the green line, I should be going horizontally because the green line was where dy dt was zero. And then I go down right, vertical, down left. It's not entirely clear without some numerical calculations, but it's possible that I am cycling about that point, at least under this extreme magnification. Now I could continue this solution and say, well, maybe I don't quite get trapped in the cycle. Maybe I continue down. Maybe I continue down like that. There's more equilibrium points above. Maybe the next one is a cycle and the one following that is a flyby. Later in chapter three, we'll give a word to this flyby, which we'll call a saddle. Well, chapter five, actually. And later in chapter five, we'll give a word to this flying by. Yeah, see, maybe we'll call this one a sink of some kind. But I just thought of something. Do I, do I circle it or do I actually get trapped by that point? You know, that's what I have to understand. Do I circle that point or actually do I get sucked into that point? Let me slide this paper up. Which one? Okay, so what I have here is I'm developing my feelings for how that system works. Now, do your confirmations with the numerical analysis. in that Mathematica notebook. You may have already tried this. You may have already seen some of this. And again, I do have questions in my own mind. Cycling or absorbing? And what does this flyby actually look like? But this is a simple way to use the X motion and the Y motion together to decide how things are flowing in the plane. Okay. Now remember, that's just a small hint about two of these equilibrium points. You need to think about the other equilibrium points. But that's taking you quite far down this problem. I don't know what's that doing. That's taking you 60, 70% of the way down this problem possibly. These points right here are hard to name. They can be approximated. They could be solved for exactly, but not easily. Don't try to solve for these points exactly. These points you can see exactly immediately from this equation. You can approximate these values. You know the Y value exactly. The y value is 1 pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi. But what's the x value where they meet? That you could do approximately. And I showed that to you on the Desmos sheet. So at 3 pi, that's negative 2.426. That's solving where the red curve and the green curve meet. Okay, let's move on.
So we're back here at our page. This is section 2.4 we're going to discuss next. That qualitative analysis is beautiful. It's interesting. It takes, takes some practice though. Are there any solutions to systems I can have exactly? Are there any systems that have exact solutions that I can use as a foundation or base? And 2.7, we'll talk about the SIR model. And in between, I left that out. We'll expand Euler's method to systems. And the Excel spreadsheets are on our website. Okay, so section 2.4. Analytic methods for special systems. And really the news is a, it's a little bit bleak here. There aren't many systems that we could solve by hand exactly, but sometimes when you can, it's interesting. I'm just making sure I'm keeping up with my outline properly. Here's a first example. You know, dx dt is any messed up combination of x's and y's under the sun. dy dt any messed up combination of X's and Y's under the sun. This is the general case. Almost impossible to solve analytically. But what if F was a little bit simpler or G was a little bit simpler? Excuse me, slide the paper up, move the paper. What if F or G was slightly simpler? whatever that means. Okay, number of paper, move to next paper. So for example, what if I chose this? And when I say this, and it looks too simple, don't fault me yet. We're just thinking out loud. And let's make my initial condition here, x at zero, y at zero. Let's say it's um, negative one and positive four. Sometimes people abbreviate x of zero, y of zero as just x not, y not. But when you say this, don't say t is zero. This is x not y not, because maybe t zero could be some other number like three seconds or two seconds or one second. But in this problem, I chose t not to be zero. So when someone says x not y not, they're generally referring to a general t not. If I wanna be specific that t not is equal to zero, I either have to state it or I physically write it in here. 
Well, this is not a complicated system. I know the answer to this system right now. X of t is minus e to the 2t, and y of t is 4 e to the minus 3t. Why is that? Because this is classic exponential growth, classic exponential decay. Now with that initial condition, this is exponential growth upside down, and this is exponential decay in the truly classical sense. But what are these? This is the MVP of ODEs. And what makes this easy to solve is that even though it is a system, it is a system where the two equations are simply ignoring each other. This dx dt only depends on x. dy dt only depends on y. Well, then you should argue, you know, you can consider, well, is this really a system at all? But it is a legitimate system because I'm solving two equations at once. But this kind of system is called decoupled. That means that the two equations have nothing to do with each other. And if you can solve them individually, you're fine. Now I picked two ones that were easy to solve individually. This could have had more X's messing it up. This could have had more Y's messing it up. But if DX DT only depends on X and DY DT only depends on Y, then really these are two separate equations even though it's one system, and I call that a decoupled system. So let's file that away. If the system is decoupled, I can find the solution by hand as long as I can solve each one individually by hand. This has an analytic solution. you know, a formula for an answer, so long as both, or I could say if both equations have analytic solutions. I'm not writing very neatly, I apologize, but Hopefully you can make it out and I'm speaking it alongside. Okay, so this is in our toolbox. If I've got a decoupled system, then I got a chance of finding an exact answer. But that seems kind of special. Let's try another one. What if the two equations were not fully involved with each other? Uh, what word should we invent? We could invent half decoupled or partially decoupled. Actually, that's the word people use. You could talk about a partially decoupled system. If one equation does not depend on the other, but maybe the second equation or the first equation depends on the other. So I'm gonna pull an example out of the book just to do one for you. I'm not gonna show you the book, but this example is from 2.4. Let's do a problem on a 2.4. I'm looking at 2.4.13. 2.4.13. Let's sketch out the solution to this nicely. This is from the textbook. And it says here's dx dt is 2x. And by the way, this solution is posted online. So I'm going to sketch out the solution. You could read the entire solution very carefully online. Let's see how much we can do here. Here's why I call it partially decoupled. Because dy dt only depends on y. In fact, I can solve that right away. But dx dt depends on x and y. But at least I have a plan. Maybe I could solve this and stick it into there, insert it into here. So this is called partially decoupled. 
let's do initial conditions on this. And the initial condition he gives you in the problem in the book is X not Y not is zero one. Now he is in that sense, very generally implying that T naught is zero. You have no harm if you assume T naught is zero. Legally, he's not saying T naught is zero. Okay, let's solve it. Well, first to solve Y, I'll just write down the answer because this is exponential decay with an initial condition of one. So this answer is e to the minus three T. Remember that was the very first differential equation we solved in the class. And I said to you, you no longer do separation of variables, integrate logs, garbage, garbage, write down the answer. No, you just need to look at this problem and see that answer. The one e to the minus three T. Now let's insert into dx dt. And so I now have a new problem called dx dt is 2x minus 8 to the e minus 3t with an initial condition of x of 0 equals 0. Sorry, I always got to monitor my paper. Bring it back. Okay, got it. And I'm just looking at this. Okay, good. So, uh, you know, this is accessible to us. This is from section 1.9 or 1.8. Oh, did I forget to square the y? It's supposed to square the y, right? That must be important. This is section 1.9, 1.8. You take your choice. I think we could do either method here, method of undetermined coefficients or method of the integrating factor. I think I'll try method of the integrating factor just for practice. But you see, I have a path to victory. I think I can solve this. I've already solved the second one. And then I have solved the system. So, I will have an analytic solution to this system, even though it's got a little more complication than the previous one. Right, so let's slide that paper down and let's solve this system. So I have dx dt is a of t x plus b of t. This is a linear equation. In our problem, a of t is 2, the constant 2, and b of t is, uh, be careful with your squaring. Squaring, when you raise a power to power, you multiply powers, right? So minus 8 e to the minus 6 t. That's the correct way to do that. Now let's pull out my formula with a method of integrating factors, 1 over mu of t integral u of t dt, u of t b of t dt. Got it? Now let's work out the mu. It's the exponential of the opposite of the integral of a of t. It's like the quadratic formula. I have to know this formula, which is e to the minus integral 2 dt, which is e to the minus 2t. Now, you could say again, remember we mentioned this when we first introduced it, shouldn't you have a plus C in here? And the answer is, and you, if you read the presentation in the book or in my notes, really all I need is one integrating factor that does the trick. So I don't need to consider all possible integrating factors. That's why it's called an integrating factor. So if I just say C is zero here, then I have E to the minus two T for my mu and that's fine. Now let's insert into a formula, one over integral, and here's minus eight, e to the minus six t dt. Get my paper moved up properly. Put in my e to the minus two t here. 
in here and continue. So the reciprocal of e to the minus two t is e to the two t. Here I have now integral minus eight e to the minus eight t. That looks very friendly. Sometimes when things look too friendly, you get upset or nervous, like you made an example or made an ex 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 uh, accident. Word I'm looking for is error. When things come out too nicely, it looks like you got an error, but I know the integral of this exactly. E to the minus eight t. Because when I differentiate this, I get minus eight e to the minus eight t. This time I have to use a c because I need to incorporate the initial condition. But let's work on the initial condition right now. X of zero is zero. So when I put zero in for T, maybe for to just tear off the paper from the beginning on the paper slides easier, doesn't it? Okay. When I use T equals zero, the right-hand side becomes one, one, C. When I use T equals zero, the left-hand side becomes zero. So forget about the one here or divide by one, whatever you want to say, C is minus one. So now I think I have my solution to the initial value problem, the system plus the initial condition. X of T is C, put a C here. Now I might as well multiply this exponential in since it's relatively nice. So I have minus E to the two T minus one right there. And then plus one E to the minus 60. My y of t, I already did at the very beginning, was e to the minus 3t. I'm kind of curious about how these interact, how these work together. And we're approaching a break in a second, but let's see if I can do some graphics on this. I could do graphics easily, or I could do graphics in a Mathematica notebook. Let's do the easy version of the graphics, first of all, in Desmos. Now, by the way, <laughs> these two solutions clearly meet the initial condition. Put a t is zero in here, you get zero and you get one. That does not mean they solve the problem. I'd actually have to insert these into the original problem to verify that. And I can do that because it's not hard to differentiate exponentials. So you could actually verify that this solves the differential equation system and you can verify that it meets the initial conditions. As I said to you, this problem is posted. I might show you the solution in a second, but I'm curious how these two functions dance together. So I'm gonna to go to Desmos. Oh, sorry, I'm constantly letting people in. I'm gonna take these two functions and go over to Desmos and see how they interact together parametrically. I'm sharing screen, back to browser, over to Desmos, kill that work that we talked about earlier. And let's type in X of T equals minus e to the power 2t. Gosh, okay, then we see this error and I'll show you what's going on. Plus e to the power 6t. You know what? This is a graph of the correct exponential, but Desmos, just insists that a lowercase x means horizontal axis. So it drew it sideways. I could draw it properly by moving to a capital X. Okay, that's better. Remember that Desmos 
always believes that lowercase x is lower is the horizontal axis, lowercase y is the vertical axis. That can be a problem. Let me type in my y. y of t equals e to the minus 3t. And I'll make that capital and vertical, even if I don't have to, because I want to keep these separate. Now remember, this is not the parametric solution. This is not the solution in the phase plane. These are the individual components of the solution. Now let's put them together. X of T comma Y of T. I think as most will like this. Well, I gotta put a capital Y there, right? Good. Now I get this little purple thing like, this is meaningless. Let me turn off the other two. Let's make this red, first of all, a little more visible. Turn off the other two. And then notice something. Do you see that Desmos says this goes from zero to one? Let's put it from minus one to one. Oh, I don't like that at all. That does not look like I expected it to look. So I'm going to try a different thing. The Desmos is not liking those X's and the Y's. Can I take that function and insert it there and then take that function and insert it there? You know, that does not seem to be much of an improvement because that gives me the same thing I had. This is not looking at like I expected to look. Now I got to entertain the possibility, the serious possibility that I have an error, right? So let's go back to our sheet. Here's the original problem. Always check you copied out of the book correctly. Yes, yes, because sometimes that's exactly what happened. You just copied the wrong thing out of the book. Uh, I saw the dy dt is e to the minus 3t with initial condition 1. Yes. I insert it into here. <coughs> and if you see an error, you can shout it out. Uh, and that is e to the minus 6t minus 8 e to the minus 6t. Yes, and I took that here. And then I figured out the mu, the e to the minus 2t. I'm going to go to the solution on our website in a second, but I'm just tracing this to see if we can find an error first. Minus 8, minus 8, 1. Because when we look at the solution, I'll, we'll see the error right away. This is a negative 1. This is an e to the minus 6t positive and the e to the 2t negative. This is the negative 3t. Okay, so I suspect an error right here. Let's check a solution I posted online. And by the way, this is an odd numbered problem in the book. So he has the solution posted in the book. I'm just trying to think, is there anything like sillily obvious that I'm missing? Okay, so I'm going to open up the solution and just share it with you. 2, 4, 13. Got it, got it. Of course, as soon as we see it, then we find the error. Uh, I don't see that yet. Okay, but now let me share it with you. This is the problem and we've copied it out of the book correctly and we got the general solution. So first we note the general solution to y is this. And I stuck, I didn't insert the constant right away. So why was I upset that I didn't insert the constant right away? Then I'm coming up with C equals one for that. So but this is the solution. Notice the solution that we wrote. So either my graphics were all correct, 
So we're essentially following the solution because I have the same solution here that we have on the paper. Maybe the graphics, maybe I just thought the graphics looked bad. So let's look at the graphics. No, the graphics actually do look bad because I'm expecting this red thing right here. So now I'm gonna pop back to Desmos. So this is from Mathematica and the red solution is the solution that matches what we wrote on our paper. I'm gonna pop back to Desmos really quickly and see why, ah, now I see why. Okay, good. So don't ever hesitate to shout out if you see me typing something silly. In our solution on the paper, this was minus 60. So this red curve is correct. It matches the black curve. And if I do a correct scaling, let's run this from, uh, minus four to four. And let's run this Y values from uh, minus four to four. And now let's do one extra step and let's share whole screen. Now we gotta take a break too. Sharing whole screen is a little bit awkward because too much information on the screen. But you do see now that the red curve that we traced in Desmos does match the red curve that I did in Mathematica. Do you understand that neither one of these is a proof that I did it right? The only way to show that I did it right is to physically insert the X of T and Y of T into the original system. But now this is what I thought I was gonna see when I drew it. Okay, back to just this paper for a second. So these black solutions are with different initial conditions. What do we have here? We have a system with some kind of interesting things happening, but we were able to solve it analytically. We have the red curve solution formula. We can have the black curve solutions formulas too. We just use different initial conditions. So why were we able to do this exactly? Because this was a partially decoupled system. I was able to solve Y independently and then insert into X. So we've got partially decoupled, accessible, decoupled, accessible. Now, if dx dt would have been impossible to solve, then it wouldn't matter that I had a partially decoupled system, right? So really, there's still a lot of caveats on this. There's still a lot of things I had to get lucky on. Systems don't always give me analytic solutions. In fact, rarely give me analytic solutions. Okay, this is a place where we're going to have to break. So we've looked at this, well, we promised. There are some systems that I can do by brute force, decoupled and partially decoupled. And sometimes they occur even in physical situations or in nature. So it's worth seeing them. But after this, really, no, it's, it's there's, there's one other special system we can do by brute force, and that's chapter three. But really, most systems, I need the machine power, numerical, and I need the qualitative analysis skills that we illustrated at the beginning of the class. So let's take five, and then let's go to machine power. Let's do Euler's method for first order system. So back on paper, let's take five, let's come back at talked and talked 108. I'm going to mute my microphone, stretch my legs, and you can do the same, and then we'll be right back.
Okay, we're back. Oh, I'm coming back a little bit early, so I'm not going to cheat you out of two minutes. So I'll wait for a second. But the reason I just hit the unmute button is because it's got a really nice question here in the chat, direct chat. So I will answer that question that someone direct messaged to me. And I just want to point out again, I, I don't make any record or saving of the chat. And if you chat to everyone, then everyone sees it. And that could be okay with you. If you want to just chat to me privately, and I'll answer the question publicly, that's fine with me too. So uh, let me see, if I can pull up my website and do this. Good. So that, that's a good question. Thank you. I'm kind of a strange person about processes and I'm not, I'm not completely strange. I don't want you guys to worry about me, but Have you ever seen that t-shirt? Have you ever seen the t-shirt that says, I'm CDO? It's a little bit like being obsessive compulsive, but the letters are in the correct order. So sometimes I'm a little bit like that. <laughs> okay, back to the question. So the question was, someone said, uh, I, I mentioned that exam terminates on July 6th, the third exam terminates on July 6th, and the class on the Delta website runs one to July, uh, only to July 1. That is correct. Now let's go to the website and I'll explain why. Go back to there, back to website, back to Dave's web corner. And let's go back to the outline of the whole course. So here are the outline of the whole course. I, I made each one of these weeks a seven day period because I wasn't going to be prejudiced about which days I'm using. So technically the class terminates on July 1. But we are covering these four sections in the last week. And We'll use the same pattern that we used before. On Thursday, July 1, we're going to have just a practice day where we talk about these four sections. On Wednesday, you got to write a calendar and count this backwards. On Wednesday, June 30, we'll talk about sections four and five here, most likely. Or I'd have to sit. Yes, yeah, so why don't we do this legally? on a calendar. So, because it's an important question. So let's look at that last week right here. And this is Monday, 28, Tuesday, 29, Wednesday, 30, and Thursday, I'll use R for Thursday, July 1. Okay. Back to website. So we have to cover these four sections in that week, in that last week of class. How are we going to cover the four sections? Uh, maybe two the first day, one the next day, one the next day. And if the class is over on July 1, I could give you your exam on Wednesday at 11.59 and have you return it on Thursday at 11.59. So we could end the class on J July 1 in that way. But really, you, you don't have much alternative. If, if you want it to be done that way, I'll change the course. But what I anticipated is that you do 6-2 and 6-3 on this day, 6-4 on this day, 6-5 on this day, do our ordinary review on that day, and then release the exam to be submitted on the next Monday. 
So I was gonna follow the pattern I did on the first two exams. Otherwise, I'm gonna to talk to you about 6.5 on Wednesday, and you're gonna hand in homework and the full test. And that is a very, very rough road. And I do not mind, sorry, gotta move my calendar up here. I do not mind if you physically complain about that, but I have a certain number of sections I have to cover and I don't have any choice in the matter. So I'd rather give you the exam on the first, you know, account for the holiday of the fourth, but give you the full four days to do this exam. If you'd like to discuss that with me individually or privately, that's fine. But I did not wanna give you 24 hours to do an exam for the other exams I gave you four times 24 hours. And I cannot push these sections into the previous week unless you wanna have a very bad experience also. So, right, no, uh, and, and thank you for the feedback. You, you can all give me feedback and if you want a different arrangement, I can make a different arrangement. Possibly I could make a different arrangement individually, but I don't think you want the third exam accelerated. Okay. Back to paper. So again, that, that's a good and serious question. Thank you, I appreciate that question. But sometimes the answers aren't pleasant or happy answers. Let's look at section 2.5 quickly. And to do this, what I'm going to do is look at that previous problem we just did. But this time I'm going to do it on a spreadsheet. So do you saw when I went to Desmos and I typed in the formulas, I said to myself, this is not what I think it should look like. And then I rediscovered I had an error later. And then I said, oh yes, this is what I think it should look like. Well, what does it mean by what I think it should look like? Where did I get an impression of what I thought it should look like. I must have previously done some kind of numerical number crunching. That's right. So my qualitative analysis, my analytic solution should be consistent with any kind of numerical estimate I make, right? So let's do this in a spreadsheet. Let's do this with Euler's method. So let's say, take two, as they say in the movies, on a spreadsheet. Let's say, take two with Euler's method. And I think I actually have this spreadsheet ready-made for you on the website. I certainly have a spreadsheet ready-made for you on the website. But to be really, really fair, let me start with an incredibly blank spreadsheet. So you just see the work happening. Let's execute this on a spreadsheet, Euler's method. And then see if it doesn't match what I expected it to match. Okay, good. So let me get out of that. Let me get out of that. Let me open up a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. And I might even want to go full screen on this. So you see me pulling the Microsoft menus when I do. So let's try full screen on this. Uh, that makes the Microsoft cell entries kind of small, but let's deal with that. I will make this sheet larger as we go along. So I want to have a column for counting, a column for exposition, a column for Y position, a column for the function that describes x rate of change, 
I will pump up these letters in a second, as soon as I see how big they are. A column for the function that describes Y rate of change. It's too small for me to read even here on my desktop. A column for the change in X, a column for the change in Y, and I guess a column for the change in T because I generate the change in X and the change in Y from the change in T. So I think these are all the columns I want. And let me see what's the best way to pump this up. I went too crazy there. I could do this. I could center these puppies. And is that almost readable? It is almost readable. I think that's kind of readable. Okay, thank you for the feedback. I can make it more readable. Yeah, I think that's better. And I can thin out those columns. If that's, uh, if you need more on that one size, let me know. Okay, good. So now let's count. Uh, at the first instance, my initial condition is zero and one. My function, and you can refer to the paper, the problem of the book, is two times x minus eight times y squared. So I want to say equals two times x minus eight times y. So that's building that function. Good, now let's do the g function, which is minus three times y, equals minus three times y. So it's just a spreadsheet. My delta t, I don't quite know what to use right here. The second, 10th of a second, half of a second. I don't know, let's be mellow and say half of a second, because we can always change it. Now how do I write the dx? It'll be the rate of change of x, which is the f column, times the elapsed time, which is the dt column. I don't mean f column that way, I meant the f function column. So for this, I'm gonna say equals this times this, got it. Then I'm gonna say dy is equal to the g function times the elapsed time. Got it. Now I have the first line in the table and I'll make this prettier by numbers in a second. What do I mean by prettier by numbers? Here's one digit, maybe for these people, let's always go four digits. Maybe for all the table, I wanna run four digits. You know, uh, Excel keeps all the digits behind the scenes, but I'm seeing these four digits. Okay, now let's go to the next line. I will make this equal to the line above plus one. So that'll naturally count the Ks. Now I'll make this equal to the entry above plus the DX. Got it. I'll make this entry equal to the line above plus the DY. Got it. And even if I'm speaking very fast or working very fast here, at least it's being recorded, I'm pretty sure. We've got all the recording set. Then this formula, which did what? This formula dealt with those two cells. I could just copy and paste or drag there. Now that formula deals with those two cells properly. Good. Now I can drag this one. I don't wanna drag this. What I wanna do is if I drag this down, it looks cool, but it's a number 0.5. What I want it to be is if I change this number, I want all the numbers to change in this column. So let's rather make this equal to that one above. Then if I change this to 0 0.1, the other one changes to 0 0.12. Little, little Excel stuff going on here. Now this one was made out of those two. So I think I can just drag that down. Yes, I think I can just drag that down. So I didn't drag down the whole thing yet. Now I can drag down the whole thing. But is it, 
are the numbers happening the way I want them to do? Half of negative four is negative two, half of 1.5 is simplified. I think the numbers are happening. So now I'm gonna drag this down considerably. Okay, now I've got an Excel table. Now notice my uh, X values are getting super duper huge, but that matches what I expected when this thing went out the door, right? How many seconds have elapsed? You know, I didn't think of that. I need a column for seconds, just so I know how many seconds elapsed. This is why I did full screen, so you could watch me pulling down the menus. Let's make a column for TK. And my initial TK was zero. And then every new TK is going to be the one above plus the delta T. Good. So now if I fill that, excuse me, if I fill that, uh, it doesn't feel good. It's going to, yeah, I, I misdid that formula. Undo, undo. I'm going to make this cell equal to this element plus this element. Okay, now I can fill down. There we go, five and a half seconds. So at five and a half seconds, this solution is basically out the door, leftwise. Let's change this to 0 0.1. Now I've done one second of solution. I'm gonna kill that line. I can paste later. And now we need to do some graphics. So I'm gonna do, uh, what I might do first is slim the columns. Hey, David. Go ahead. Look at the chat. Uh, thank you very much. Get the chat out here. Good. Good, I think you're right. So what was this going on right here? This was the F column was minus eight times the Y column squared. My error, I correct that. And then let's pull that down. Did it help me, did it hurt me? Not sure yet. You know, the proof is in the pudding, but thank you for the solution. Uh, got it, got it. So now let's do the graphics. If the graphics match, at least I'll feel better. So what I'll do is highlight X, K, Y, K columns, and I'll go insert, scatter plot, or connecting. I'm not sure which one I'll pick right now, but let's try connecting. Now, what's going on right here? I don't like that at all. This looks a little bit like my bad solution from previous, doesn't it? It's doing the XK and the YK separately. So I don't like that chart. I think I'm gonna rather uh, do a scatter plot. You could massage, whoops, replace. You could massage that chart so it would have worked. Let's try scatter plot. Okay, good. I like this. This is solution. And let's connect the scatter plot, blah, blah, blah. Too much decoration is gonna be required here. Let me close that box so I can see it. I can have a solid line connecting them. I want a solid line connecting all of them. I'm spending too much time fumbling with that, okay. Now, the other thing I saw is like, I need some positive X's here. Like I need to talk about the past of the solution. This looks like it could be my solution, but I need to talk about the past. Let's move this over to the side here. What I need is to, in a sense, run this Euler's method backwards. Let's see if I can do that. Let's insert a cell. Let's insert a whole batch of cells. And let's see if I can run Euler's method backwards from that starting place. This is not what I intended to do, but let's see what happens. So there's my starting place. So how do I work backwards? Uh, from my DT, I would subtract the T increment, 
that would give me backwards that second. From my x, I would subtract x increment. x increment was right there. No, no, no. This minus x increment. Now you might say, oh, there's a problem with doing that. So hang on a second. I'll subtract y increment. Got it. And then I can run this formula directly there and run this formula directly there. I don't need them to be grayed. Yeah, I guess this is the price for doing things from scratch. But that looks like the correct formula I've executed. That looks like the correct formula I've executed. I will make this equal to that, and that should be transferable. I'll make this and this equal to that. And this cell will be the minus first step. So 0 minus 1. Got it. OK, now I don't know why those are all not right justified, but I'll make them all right justified. And now I'll see if I can pull up. Uh, so this is a little bonus work here. I'm going forwards in time and backwards in time with one of those methods. Let's go backwards one second. OK, good. Now, again, the proof is in the pudding. Those numbers do not look beautiful to me, but let's add them to our chart. We add them to our chart by, first of all, drawing these boxes up to there. This box up to there. Does not look happy, does it? And we're going to have to do that, aren't we? So I'm going to make this box so you can see it in a reasonable size. Good. Sorry, you can see that box in a reasonable size. I was expecting this to go backwards like that. So what did I do badly? in my formulas. If I go backwards, I always have to be subtracting the increment, right? So did I subtract increment? Yes. Did I subtract increment there? I think that problem, that column is your problem. Yeah. Just look at them going up and down. Yes. See, okay, this is good debugging here. So there's an adding. So I need to put this here. And yeah, circular reference, I got it. And I need to subtract. And I need to make that reference there and that reference there. Okay, that looks better. That point's corrected. Now let's do the same thing right here. So good. So now I think I have those references corrected. Now let's see if I can draw, if I can pull up. Let's do that off to the side for effect. And then ta-da. You might not like this, but this is actually correct. Do you see my extreme x's and y's? Let's pull down and grab this, nope, sorry. Grab these things and pull them down to a more reasonable space. That, now this is crude. And the reason it's crude is because I'm winging it, right? But that is the curve I expected to see. That is the curve I expected to see. Now, the beauty of this, watch this. This is really cool. The beauty of this is if I change this initial condition, let's make it two. 
Oh, I get another example. Let's make it minus two or minus one. Ooh, I get the solution from below. Now, do you realize what's happening here is because I'm letting it automatically draw the window. So let me fix it so it doesn't automatically draw the window and you'll be even more impressed. Uh, but I wanna move on to a different thing here. So let's say that's that angle, that's right. Let's say this is minus nine to nine. Good, and the axes is all, I don't want the axes there littering the whole thing, right? But I'm not gonna worry about that right now. You know, on the website, I give you a pretty Excel worksheet that does this. You can use the one of your choice. But you see now when I change this, I get these different solutions that I expected. Oh, there's one. See, do you remember what they looked like in the previous thing I showed you? Go back and look at the actual solution. Yes, in fact, I could build a whole phase portrait from this. What about if I put a solution at zero, zero? Well, that's an equilibrium point. How about zero, one? I'm sorry, how about one, zero? Shooting out on that horizontal line. How about minus one, zero? Shooting out on that horizontal line. Uh, one of the nice things about Excel here is I see how the points are accelerating as I go along. I see that in the table too, but I don't see it visually. Okay. You know, I haven't proved anything. I haven't proved anything. Still, the only test for what I have as a solution is if I take this analytic solution, let's go back to my paper now. Enough Excel with Dre. The only way I'm gonna prove that I'm correct to you is if I physically insert this and see if it works, which I'm not gonna do right now because we need to do other things. But do you see your problem now? What happens if you don't got one of these to physically insert and see if it works? What if you don't have an analytic solution? Then you must do what? Then you must rely on the numerics. Then you must rely on your qualitative chops, right? What's the alternative? The alternative is not solving the equation at all. You know, which would you rather have? I'm sure I hear some voices in the background saying, well, that's okay by me, let's not solve it. Well, yeah, that's true. The general average person on the street doesn't need to solve this equation, but you, are heading for a place where you do want to solve these equations. And if you have an analytic solution, that's great. But still the numerics and the qualitatives give you a visual confirmation, right? And if you don't have an analytic solution, well, you just got another lesson that said the numerics and qualitative analysis are the only things you got. And so you have to develop your skills in those two areas. Okay, good. Sorry for the rush. Sorry for the doing it from scratch. But on the other hand, I do want to emphasize this. And I did say this on the first day of the course. Uh, Bill Gates can be forgiven for all his other sins for writing Excel, actually for buying Excel and then rewriting it. I'm only being kind of silly. Excel is possibly the greatest single computer program ever written. Now, of course, we've gone beyond that. But, but Excel can do a heck of a lot. And sometimes it does a heck of a lot and you get really nervous, like when they're running the nuclear power plants in Excel spreadsheets. So, and uh, I don't want even want to say this. I, I know someone who's working at Consumers Energy and this is not a mean thing to say and I don't want to make you upset but if that person says, hmm, using some old technology here. You guys heard about the meat processing plant that got hacked, right? Are we gonna have shortages in some meat for a while? We are way, way, way too exposed in ancient technology. 
and it's going to hurt us. Maybe it has something to do with this pandemic. <laughs> So I do, I, I do think we should, I, I'm, everything I read talking about security and so forth makes me a little more nervous. Uh, okay, so let's talk about this SIR model. And, and I'm not just wasting time when I talk about these things, because I want you to understand that I can show you a lot of technical tricks, you know, like jump through these hoops, jump through these hoops, but now you got to take them somewhere, right? And you're going to take them to civil engineering. You're going to take them to mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, computer engineering, even. This has applications to computer engineering, the, the concept of differential equations. And you guys, many of you are going to have to fix the mess and soon I'll be dead. And I don't mean that in a mean way. I'm just saying you're going to, most likely outlive me and you have got the mess. Well, it's time to clean up the mess. So I have to show you these weapons, analytic, qualitative, numerical, but you guys are gonna have to visualize the solutions that clean up the mess. I like to say that when I went to school in the 1980s, my degree was mathematics, and I had a minor in theoretical computer science. And nowadays, everything that I learned in that minor in my master's degree is done by a freshman and sophomore in college. It was beautiful. It's wonderful to see those things advancing in your lifetime, in real time, right? But you guys have a lot of work to do. Okay, let's check this out the SIR model of infectious diseases. And what I will do also is maybe I'll do some more graphics of this tomorrow in review mode. But let's at least set you up in this idea. And the idea here is, and I'm following the presentation in your book, so I'm not doing anything novel right here. Let's just say we want to model how an infection spreads. It could be a benign infection like the common cold. It could be a serious infection like HIV or COVID-19. We, we basically have three people in the universe. Susceptibles. infecteds or infected, and I'm pluralizing it, and recovereds. When you talk about the common cold, susceptible infecteds, recovereds, recovereds are the people that had a cold last week. When you talk about a serious disease like COVID-19 or HIV, recovereds are the people who might be dead. I'm being very blunt with you because I got to discuss this from a casual mathematical point of view, but I'm not trying to be coarse or mean spirited because I know that a lot of people were affected by COVID-19. So I am not trying to be too casual, too lighthearted with this, but I'm just saying recovereds are people that no longer have the infection and, and they might not be susceptible or infected anymore. They just might not be present. So for this very simple model, dying from the infection is a form of recovery because you are no longer susceptible and you are no longer infected, okay? So be very generous with me when I discuss serious things in a mathematically cold way. Now, we agree that all these things are changing. In fact, when it comes to the cold, the recovereds can go back to being susceptibles, maybe to another strain of cold. Let's talk about the very simplest case where the infection is something you catch and recover from and you don't get it again. Is that COVID-19? 
We're not entirely sure yet. There's some evidence that it's not, but small case. So I'm gonna take the simplest case where you're susceptible or you become infected or you become recovered and you don't go back to being susceptible. Okay, so, well, each time these three buckets are changing their contents. The susceptibles are decreasing or increasing, the infecteds are decreasing or increasing, so are the recovereds. So I can talk about the rate of change in all three cases. And again, I'm gonna talk about the simplest case, the case that's exactly presented in the book. And that's that people become infected by interacting with infected people. If you don't have a cold, the only way you could catch a cold is if you interact with someone who has a cold, meet them, talk to them, whatever. So it's a little bit like rabbits and foxes meeting and that detracts from the rabbit population. When susceptible and infected people meet, that detracts from the susceptible population. It moves them into the infected population. How quickly does it move them? We don't know. That becomes alpha. That's like the speed. That's a parameter that measures how fast this stuff spreads. Now let's look at the infected population. They are both gaining people and losing people. They are gaining all these people that came from the susceptible box. But a certain percentage of infected people regularly become uninfected. Why do they? Because the cold lasts three days, the flu lasts a week. For whatever reason, among the infected people, depending on their size, I regularly lose infected people. What is the rate at which I lose infected people? I really don't know. That's another parameter. I'll call that parameter beta. And that parameter means the rate at which people recover. The cold lasts three days, the flu lasts seven days, COVID-19 lasts X days. How about the recovered people? They gather all these people that used to be infected, but now they're not infected. <clears throat> so this is a very simple model. It's called the SIR model. And we're doing well on time, but I think I'm gonna postpone graphics to tomorrow. But first I wanna say this before I go on with this model. So it's a little bit like predator prey, the interactions here, but it's not predator prey. Uh, it's three dimensional. I thought you promised us, Dave, last week that we wouldn't, or on Monday, on Tuesday, that we wouldn't do three dimensional. Okay, we'll fix that in a second, but it is kind of three dimensional. Three variables, S I R. Uh, it depends, it has these parameters, alpha and beta, that depend on the illness. What does that remind you of? Section 1.7, bifurcation values. Remember, the quantities of this alpha and beta could dictate how this behaves. Okay, good, so I've woken those things up. Uh, if you read the medical journals or the mathematical journals, sometimes you see the SEIR model which stands for susceptible, exposed, infected, recovered. So what I wanna say is this is the most simple model I could make. I could add many other variables. I could add many other stages. I've seen models, uh, let's say, I'll just speak from experience. Again, I'm not speaking coldly. I've seen models of HIV infection in Africa where they broke the categories down to the bands of 10 years in age. So they had something like 10 dependent variables and the independent variables time. And then they watched how people moved 
from one category to the other by age and infection and recovery. Because what they were doing was testing out different drugs on HIV infection. And what's the question there? Well, until very recently, the question there was, will this drug prolong the life of this person? And, and now, and I'm not a medical person, so don't take anything I say exactly, but now we've got drugs that are pretty good at doing that, pretty good at keeping uh, HIV dormant. I See, I don't know these medical words. So what I'm trying to do right now is say, this is the simplest possible model of infectious diseases that I could present to you in a reasonable time. Okay, now let's try to work some more magic. Uh, I do feel uncomfortable with three variables because I don't want to do any three-dimensional systems right here. But notice the R does not appear on the right-hand side. And now I make one other observation. S plus I plus R is equal to one. Now, this will be very careful what I say to that, what I, what I mean by that is I mean the susceptible people plus the infected people plus the recovered people are all the people. And when I say one here, I must mean 100% or 1.00. So if I express, this is gonna be helpful to us. If I express S and I and R as percentages, that's okay. 30% of the people got that new strain of cold. Then what I could do is take out the R bucket. By that I mean, I could concentrate on counting the susceptible people and the infected people. Because counting the susceptible people and infected people, if I know 30% are susceptible and 40% are infected, then must be 30% recovered. So that's, that's just a small cheat, but that means that I only have to concentrate on this system. Okay, now I'm gonna prep. So I'm gonna show you some graphics and it's gonna have to be, I'm gonna show you some graphics next time because I can't get too far into this, but I want you to understand, you could take this right now to your first order systems notebook and you could start playing with it because I just have S and I instead of X and Y. Now I'll give you a warning in Mathematica, capital I is the square root of minus one. So don't try to name capital I a variable either you can sometimes name a variable with two letters, like I think maybe even in is a protected letter, protected word in Mathematica. You know, you could just do this with X's and Y's and you'd save a lot of sanity. But then you'd have to remember who's the X's and who's the Y's. But you could take this right now to your Mathematica notebook. And in fact, I posted a Mathematica notebook on our site to show you this. And I'm not going to open it in front of you right now for considerations of time, but I'll just remind you where it is. So week two, uh, also under resources, but week two technology. Here I have the SIR model notebook where I've kind of pre-set this up for you. I do also have a partially decoupled face portrait, a, par a basically partially decoupled. So I've got some other things about the partially decoupled. Uh, the Swain skyscraper and Vanderpool's equation, those are beautiful numerical equations. I might show you the Swain skyscraper equation tomorrow in sample problems. But what I'm saying is you go and experiment with the SIR model. You could do it right now. But I also want to point out something else fun to you. And again, I'm not being callous, infectious diseases are not fun, but I want to show you 
that this has applications other than infectious diseases. So to end our session today, let me pull up a copy of the book electronically so I can show you another problem in the book and in fact, show you the problem you're going to do for money on your homework. Okay, so we're looking at the book or I'm gonna open the book in front of you in a second. I just have to pull up the book. Got it, got it. Where am I? Share book. Where's book? Okay, there's book, share book. We are together looking at the book. Okay, good. Now, uh, table of contents. We're in chapter two, section eight, SI seven, SI or model of epidemic. And let's look at the exercises. So first of all, there's not 30 of these exercises because you know this is like heavy numerical work. He's got 10 exercises right here. So I just want you to do one, but he just walks you through some of the things I've said in the first two problems. Says, why don't you try this out on a slope field? But for the remainder of the problems, notice what he starts to say to you. Oh, what would be the effect if you were vaccinated? What does vaccine do to this problem? Can I possibly find an analytic solution to this problem? What's the value of these parameters beta and alpha tell you? So beta over alpha is a very famous parameter in this problem that I can illustrate for you graphically. Six. Have you read this in the news recently? Uh, let me expand this for you. Make it easier to read. Sorry, that's too much expanding. Have you ever considered this? One of the basic assumptions of this model is that individuals who recover never get it again. However, diseases continuously evolve. Oh, what happens if some of the recovered people go back to being infected? Well, what do we have to do then? We have to modify the model. But notice that you could still use the S plus I plus R equals one. So among my recommended problems, I actually work out the solution to number six for you. You might wanna read that because this is a little more realism, isn't it? What happens when the recovered people can become infected again? You gotta worry about that. Well, epidemiologists have to worry about that. What happens when the vaccines are present? You gotta worry about that. Or you gotta hope that that helps. Next problem. Now we're getting to the fun one. In the movie, I Am Legend. Now, do you, do you know that movie, uh, Will Smith? I'm kind of a movie friend. The infecteds work together to increase the number of infecteds. You know, this is a typical zombie movie, right? So how would we modify the model in that case? Now let's think of zombies as infecteds. And susceptibles as humans. Do the susceptibles have a chance in this model? Right? Let's try again. Some zombie movies, well, okay, let's talk about, and I've never watched a single episode of The Walking Dead, but let's talk about many zombie movies where zombies just keep coming at you until the humans destroy them, right? So they do not stop infecting new victims until they're destroyed by a susceptible. In fact, the susceptibles destroy as many zombies as they can. I guess, again, I've never watched the show, but I guess that's the premise of The Walking Dead, that you're at war, or you don't want to talk about World War Z, Brad Pitt. I wonder which case is World War Z? Is World War Z more like problem seven or problem eight? You think about that. But this is the problem I want you to think about and do as a homework, hand in tomorrow night. What happens if you got this war between the susceptibles and infected, between the humans and the zombies, and you have to look at the system this way? Who's gonna win this war? 
Now you could say this is just all fun and stuff like that. I, I get it. But, uh, but this is real life infection variations that you want to consider. And so in the last problem here, he actually brings a physical case from a uh, boarding school in Britain in the 1970s and looking at the spread of what was the epidemic. It was flu. Okay. Okay, so I don't, I don't want to go, I'm going to have to bring the graphics next time. I apologize for not having time to do the graphics right now. And I'm, again, I'm not trying to be cold or calculating, but I want to show you differential equations is all over you right now. And at the beginning of this pandemic, back in March and April and June, I said to you this, you couldn't turn on a television unless they were interviewing a mathematician, trying to explain how this spread. Mathematician, epidemiologist, biologist, et cetera. So suddenly this became real. Whereas two years ago, I didn't do this section because I thought, okay, well, this is nice, but I have other things that I rather need to do. So differential equations is real life. Okay, thank you for being patient. Thank you for listening. I'm gonna turn off the recording. And if you want to hang out for a second and ask any questions you want,